That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And Ooh. today we're here to talk. <laughs> <laughs> what? The, well, you, you said a little differently. You put a little uh, stank on it. Oh, I got some stank sometimes, you know. Yes, you do. Go ahead. Uh, what are we today, today? we're here to talk about The Lost Daughter, uh, which premiered at the 2021 Venice Film Festival, where I saw it originally, uh, and it won the Best Screenplay Award. Uh, it's the directorial debut of Maggie Gyllenhaal, and it's based on a novel by Elena Ferrante. Uh, Netflix released it theatrically uh, December 17, 2021, and it oh. will be... It will be available to stream on Netflix December 31st, 2021. Oh. Uh, it's notably won four Gotham Awards, has uh, been nominated for several Independent Spirit Awards, and a couple Golden Globe nods as well. And we can uh, expect that uh, Oscar nominations are probably to follow for one or two people in this. You saw this film in Venice? Yes. And then you read the book it's based on prior to Venice. Correct. Why did you choose to read the book? Because um, I've never read anything by Elena Ferrante, and uh, who, if you aren't familiar with her, is an interesting person. No one's ever seen her. Like, no one even knows, really, if that's her true identity. Oh, she's living the dream. She's an okay. interesting person. But she has a, a, she has many other uh, novels, some of which have been turned into uh, films already. I just sounded interesting, and I usually, I, I, I make a habit, I read quite a lot of uh, books before they become films. Okay. Well, do you contest that, or what? No, you do read every day. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know why that would be strange that I would read this then. I don't think that is strange that you read it. Okay. Um, it was just a humble brag. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It was that this, like, I have perfect pitch? It's hard for me to judge. Uh, it's hard for me to watch singing competitions because <laughs> I have perfect pitch. I wish um, I don't. I'm, that, that's a 30 uh, rock. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is one of those films that you kept nagging me to watch, and you kept talking about it. And... Yeah, because it's good. It's I think it's, uh, I mean, very well done, and I really like Olivia Colman. I just posted that meme of that horse sitting down, where it's like, when my boss tells me to do something I already planned to do, and then it's like, no, I don't want to do it. That's how I feel when you try to get me to watch movies like this. Um because reading about it, I didn't have any interest. So straight out the gate, I'll say I, I do think it's very good. I would give it like three and a half out of five. Oh, okay. Um, so that being said, well, you know, this time around, I'll switch it up. Uh, the basic story is Olivia Coleman plays a character named... Lita. Lita. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lita is in Greece on vacation. She's a college professor she teaches like comp lit Com yeah comparable literature uh, an expert in italian translation so she is staying in this like uh airbnb apartment and she's going down to this beach club daily just to relax and work on her writing i guess when one day she sees a woman played by dakota johnson mm -hmm. what's her nina nina okay immediately it's clear that lita mm -hmm. Is fixated on Nina. And well, we can get back into the symbolism of her name as well. Okay, good. <sighs> to speed this up, we find out through flashbacks that Lita, Olivia Coleman's character, has two children, and her young Olivia Coleman's younger self is played by Jess Buckley. Mm -hmm. And basically, we learn that her character hated her kids. Like she just I guess after having her kids realize she didn't want them, she didn't like them, that's not the life she was about. It's also clear that like she wasn't satisfied by her husband, so she just wants to get out of there. And there's a side sort of plot of her character having an affair with the Skarsgård. Peter Skarsgård. Which uh, sort of precipitates her wanting to leave. Mm -hmm. Among And then there's another pivotal scene where she meet, her and her husband meet another couple, and, which we can get into, but... We find out that Olivia Coleman's character as a young woman with these two young children left her family for three years. Mm -hmm. So when so then going back to the present time when she's watching Dakota Johnson's character with her daughter and seeing her so frustrated with her, we get a lot of flashbacks of like Olivia Coleman as at like at the beach as a young woman with her kid and how frustrated she was. So it's clear that she's fixated on her because she sees a lot of herself in her. Yes. Okay. One day, Dakota's little girl goes missing on the beach. 
and everyone's freaking out. Dakota is with her family, this big Greek family who live in like uh, the Bronx or Queens or something, but they're in Greece for vacation because they have family there and they're not good people. They're like assholes. And this family and Olivia Coleman have a bad interaction initially. But when this little girl goes missing, Dakota Johnson's little girl, it's Olivia Coleman's character who finds her. So now she's kind of like back in form with these people. But it's important to know when that little girl went missing, she had a doll. Mm -hmm. And when Olivia Coleman brings the girl back to the family, the doll's missing. And we find out the doll's missing because Olivia's character took it and is kind of like caring for it. Okay. To wrap it up, everything culminates with Dakota Johnson visiting Olivia Coleman's character to borrow her apartment keys because Dakota wants to have an affair with some pool boy. And while she's there, Olivia's dumbass decides after, we don't know how much time has passed. It seems like several, many days. Mm -hmm. Of And they're fixated on this doll. Like, where's this doll? My daughter wants this doll. She won't shut up about this doll. Olivia finally says, oh, I have the doll. And I don't know why I took it, but here you go. And Dakota is pissed. Like, bitch, you knew I was under all this stress <laughs> because my daughter wants this doll. And I thought we were cool. And you just handed it to me, like, whatever. So another plot point is Dakota was, like, out walking with Olivia's character one day and was wearing this big floppy-ass hat. And Olivia says, oh, you need a hat pin, which looks like a big ass needle to stick into your hat. So at that final scene where the, the two of them are arguing, Dakota stabs Olivia in the abdomen with this hat pin mm -hmm. and tells her like, my family's gonna fuck you up. So you better watch out. So Olivia packs up in the middle of the night. She's not deathly wounded leaves like drives off we see her drive to the beach and she collapses on the beach mm -hmm. which is the opening of the film we see her character collapse on the beach but the final shot is olivia's character on the phone with her daughters like in the morning mm -hmm. on the beach like checking in on them so clearly she's fine the end there you go mm -hmm. you should get into how the novel differs from the movie because you were explaining those bits to me and I thought that the novel sounds much more in line with what I was what I was hoping for in this movie. Well, the novel, you know, by it what the form that it takes offers a much better interiority of Lita as a character. It's it's from her perspective and all her, you know, thoughts and desires and and dreams. So it it feels much more succinct as a portrait of Lita uh, than you know the choices I think Gyllenhaal is faced forced to make as a visual storyteller. And I think I know you were complaining about it feeling kind of unstructured, but it more or less it does follow that. I did find it curious that. Because even in the IMDb description of the narrative, it mentions this part, which is in the, the novel, but it, it's really not explicitly mentioned, is though her children are grown, what instigates this vacation is both of her daughters move to Canada. In the, in the original, it's by an Italian woman, uh, so the, 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 char the original characters in the novel are Italian anyway, but these daughters have moved to Canada, so she's, it's almost like empty nest syndrome, and she's also kind of getting over that. And it, she's relishing her freedom, like the opening pages of the book are, and then immediately becomes enmeshed in this past that she's really quite guilty about. And I think it's really a film about guilt. It's about, you know, punishing oneself, uh, if you will, over that guilt. Um, and also the taboo subject that we really rarely ever see is a, a, the story of a woman that really dislikes her children, that really hates being a mother. Yeah, and strangely, before I even watched this movie, like, because I watched this movie today, mm -hmm. and I think it was yesterday, I happened to read an article about parents talking honestly about, and the title of the article was like, I hate my children. And, it, you know, it sounds extreme, but then in the, the actual sort of interview uh, clips of copy are not um, that extreme. It's just talking about how it wasn't what they expected and they feel guilt about it. But like you said, it is a taboo subject. And, okay, so there are several things that I wish would have been different. First of all, the description of this being like a psychodrama. It is a little bit, though. It really bothered me because all of the tension of, like, the because I also saw descriptions of, like, it's kind of like a thriller. All of that tension revolves around this Greek family who already don't kind of like 
Olivia Coleman's character because of an incident they had in the beginning of the film. Well, there's this ambiguity of the depths of their violence, though, too. Because she, right. she's wounded by somebody maybe throwing something and hitting her. Or right. Like. So so then I felt this tension throughout the entire film of, like, if something's going to happen to her, and, oh, my God, if they find out she has this doll. And I just feel like we spend an hour with this doll in the background, like, this symbol of something. And really all it symbolized was, like, keeping my heart rate up. Like, like I was just uncomfortable the entire time. And it worked. It definitely worked. I was uncomfortable. But the payoff is like, I don't know. Well, the symbol of the doll is important. The symbolism of the doll is important. I, I just think the way it's crafted in this story, I felt a little bamboozled, like, like, oh, nothing's really happening. It's just kind of like, I don't know. It works. It definitely works. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I just felt like my expectation was different sure. reading the description of this film. Sure. So I think it's not the fault of the film. It's just the way it was described. This is really more of like a drama that has this like random tension to it that doesn't amount to amount to much except for getting stabbed with a knitting needle. But it doesn't amount to much. But it also is her, uh, it's kind of a, a projection of her own fears about because she knows what she's doing the whole time and the mm -hmm. kind of the paranoia that sits in when you know you're doing things in the background that nobody else knows about and to me i like that because the her she had a doll from her mother that she gave to her oldest child who ruined it and destroyed it so there's that um kind of connection parallel to this doll that she's uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Has confiscated, if you will. Uh, but also, the, do the doll is like the lost daughter because she cared more for the doll as an object. Her her love and care and affection are more for the object than for her own flesh and blood children. Another... Oh, go ahead. But I, to me, that's the lost daughter. Is yeah. These, these feelings wrapped that, up. That makes sense. Um, my, the, another thing that I wish would have been different is talking about, like, motherhood and how you know, Olivia's character feels about her child. I kind of wish the film would have focused on the triangle of mothers because you have Olivia Coleman's character, Dakota Johnson's character, and then, uh, Callie played by Dagmara Dominicic. So Callie is Dakota Johnson's like sister-in-law and Dakota Johnson's married to this douchebag guy. Um, who's kind of scary mm -hmm. towards Olivia's character. But anyway, Callie is 42 years old. So she, and, the, and she's pregnant with her first child. So we have this 42-year-old woman with this geriatric pregnancy, like, being very positive about motherhood. There's even a scene where but, she's trying to tell Olivia about, like, oh, well, how could you not do this with your kids? Mm -hmm. And then Olivia basically says, like, how you know? You don't have kids. Yeah. So, I like, I wish that we would have focused on this triangle of, like, three different types of mother. Like an old new mother, an old old mother, and then a new old mother. Because Dakota Johnson's character is young, but then she has more mothering experience than her older sister-in-law. And we really don't see that dynamic. We just kind of see, like, when Olivia and Dakota are together, they're commiserating about... They're not really commiserating. It's like Dakota's venting about how frustrated she is with her child. And then we just keep getting Olivia being like, yeah, I know, I know. It's okay, I know. And then Callie being like, Pam, being a mother is so fantastic. Like a hallmark. She's just uh, spouting stereotypes and cliches. Yeah. So, you know, I like to say what I would have preferred a story be. I kind of wish we would have found out earlier in the film. Well, not we, because we know, but that Olivia would have expressed to Dakota earlier in the film, which you say in the book she does. It, it happens in the toy store in the book. Which is much sooner than when it happens in the movie. Like she, she basically tells her, like, I also hated my damn kids. So that they could sort of commiserate and then the big finale, I think, has more weight. Because sure. up until, like in the movie, I feel like they were very friendly. And then there is one moment where Olivia says something about, oh no, it's when she's having, as a younger woman, having a little affair with Peter Sarsgaard. Mm -hmm. Professor Hardy, Thomas Hardy. And, she and then she says to him, I hate talking on the phone with my kids. And she says it like, ooh, I'm saying something naughty, but it's okay because I'm having an affair, so you're not going to judge me, right? And he's like, don't say that. And she's mm -hmm. like, no, I do hate talking to them. And, you know, they hate talking to me. And he kind of scolds her like, no, really, don't say that. Like, you're you're a shitty mom. And He doesn't say that. No, but he the, doesn't. But the implication, but the implication is, yeah. is that. So I kind of wish 
that that sort of understanding between Dakota and Olivia would have been established sooner so we can sort of develop their bond better. Mm -hmm. Because it sounds like in the book that is the case. Yes, because you think it devolves seemingly out of nowhere. It seems to evolve because if I had befriended someone, like if I were like in a similar situation where I'm out of town and I connect with some other person and we're commiserating on, let's say, being married and the struggles and I really think that we, you know, seem to see seem to see eye to eye... And then they do something to me that's really like out of left field. My first thought wouldn't be like stab you with a knitting needle. My first thought would be like, are you okay? But like, what the but fuck is wrong with you? I think it also underlines how, again, uh, Lita's perceptions are that she's, she's reading into the depths of their relationship. She, that they, they maybe have more in common that she, than is sure. actually the case. This woman just wants to use her apartment. So all of those kind of fake, kind of caring questions that Nina is asking her for are really inevitably to give what she wants from this woman, and that's it. And I like that Lita... So Lita is the name, it's from Greek mythology, and they reference a poem by Yeats uh, quite a bit, but uh, that is one of the many women raped by Zeus in Greek mythology. Uh, and she mentions how that name always conjures rape. And I, I think just how that signifies this woman who's rebuking the, you know, the patriarchy, the, the expectations of her trajectory as a, a wife and a mother and an academic even. Um, I like that she is basically setting up her own demise. She's, she's loaded the gun and she pulls the trigger on the end because that hat pin is her doing that she gives to this woman. And she presents the doll to her and Nina's reaction is, oh, you found it. And she says, no. I took it. I took it. I don't know why. And I don't know I why. I was playing a game. And it, it sounds... And as I was watching it, I was like, why are you telling me I know, me like, that? stop that. Just lie. Just lie, girl. You can lie. Uh, she... What, what was I going to say? Oh, it, on paper and even describing it, it sounds so silly. But you really get the sense that I feel like I relate to this character because that feels like something I would do. Telling about, lies? No. Being sneaky. About stealing this stupid doll from these loud, noisy-ass neighbors who have no manners. Triggered. <laughs> triggered. That's, he's talking about that dog we hear barking in our videos sometimes, which will be alleviated in about a week. Yes, but I would do something like that. Um... <laughs> It, but it also reminds me that it's this woman that you can tell that she feels like she needs to be punished and no matter what she inflicts on herself is maybe not giving her that kind of alleviation that she needs. And even as you have been talking, it reminded me of a map of the world a little bit with Sigourney Weaver, it, a very complex uh, woman uh, characterization. Uh, but as far as hateful mothers uh, or that dislike their children, this is, she's not entirely cold. This is not Mary Tyler Moore in Ordinary People or I, from what I remember, Deborah Winger in Rachel Getting Married, um, or uh, for an Isabelle Huppert reference in um, Hidden Love, where she hates her daughter, played by Melanie Laurent. Uh, there is some warmth to her. Mm -hmm. And I do really like the scene, and this is where we get Maggie Gyllenhaal throwing the Italian, Italian component of Greater Bone by having Alba Rohrwalker as part of a hitchhiking couple that visit Jess Buckley, um, and, oh and, yes yeah. that's a pivotal scene yeah um and i didn't even catch it you had to rewind it for me because they were speaking italian and i didn't catch the subtitles but there is so this is the flashback with jess buckley and her husband and they're at home when well they're on vacation they're at i think her boss's house oh. or something so they're at home like on vacation and the house is not theirs but um they see through the window uh, hitchhikers and the husband is like, let's bring them in. And she's like, don't you dare bring these people into my house. Cut to, they're all sitting at the dinner table. And we find out that the couple seems to be similar in age. They end up getting along smashingly. They're having a great night drinking, talking shit. When they, it, it's mentioned early on in their interaction that the husband of the hitchhiking couple is like not with his children. Like he's separated from the mom and they're with the mother. The mother. So when the couple leaves and they're saying their goodbyes, Jess Buckley says to the Italian lady in Italian, like, how are, how are his daughters doing? With like, the separation. With, with the separation. And the lady's like, um, well, they're fine, but they're also his sons. They're not girls. They're boys. And it took me... I, I didn't catch it. You had to explain it to me that she's projecting her daughters onto this situation and trying to get a sense of 
like, would her daughters be okay if, if she, she left? If, if she runs out on their asses. So I thought that was a very good. Um, I think the story is very strong. Mm-hmm. I just think the screenplay is lacking for me a little bit, like the the organization of it. That's all. Sure. Yeah, and she is making Jillian Hall is making very uh, different choices in the organization compared to the book, which you know, what whatever. I, I think that for a first film, though, I think it is impressive. So I only know Olivia Coleman from the movie The Father. Uh, we reviewed another movie about those snake worshippers. With Jim Gaffigan? Yeah. She's, she's in, in that? She's in that as well. You I really, don't remember her in that. But. You, really, you really need to see The Favorite, which you won her Oscar for. But if you are an Olivia Coleman move fan and have not seen the film Tyrannosaur, which Patty Considine directed, that performance in that is fantastic. What I was going fantastic. to say is I really like her from the one film I remember her from, The Father. Mm-hmm. And I really liked her in this. I really like her. I just really like her energy. Same. I like that she looks like a real human being. That being said, since I got to talk about elderly people... She doesn't look elderly. She doesn't look elderly, but there's a point made in the story more than once with characters like saying, like, how old are you? And they're like, you look so young for... Because she says she's 48. And they're like, you look amazing. Like, there's no way you're 48. Like, two characters say that to her on two separate occasions. In the book, it's all over the place, yeah. And I just think that that lady looks her age if not older so i don't understand why like that's brought up that's a forced in the text and i i don't know that i don't think it fits olivia coleman they should have said she was 58 oh my God. but she's well, not she is about that age i mean again i think she looks like a normal person she who's does. 48 years old she but does. to call out twice by two different characters a man and a woman oh yeah because we haven't even brought up ed harris who plays lyle the um groundskeeper of the airbnb she's at that subplot of them sort of like him trying to romance her i didn't need that but in the book it has more significance it reflects more on how she navigates because there's a scene in the bar and she has this whole kind of internal conflict where he's talking to her at the bar and she goes over and makes a pass at him in public that's her way of taking control of a situation that she has conjured up maybe in her mind yeah, in the movie, I didn't really connect with that storyline. It just felt like extra bits that could have been removed. Well, I guess. they have that scene where he brings the, the the octopus and cooks it for her, and he talks about how he's a terrible person as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the the you know he sh- he sees the doll lying out and shakes it. And he also has ties to the Dakota Johnson's family, and she tries to she knows there's something in that doll because it leaks on her almost like on her breast like it was breastfeeding or it vomited it vomited and then there's a big worm inside it that is disgusting um yeah there's just so many interesting um so much interesting symbolism tied into that doll i think i only know dakota johnson from the 50 shades of gray movies Uh, whatever i don't know i don't know that i check for her and i don't have enough a thought about her except that she's probably famous because her parents are famous but and her grandparents oh well, well tippy hedren's her grandma so, but no shade to her, except that I've never really thought she looked great. And then in this film, I, I do think she looks really nice. I think she's the most striking she's ever been in this film. But that hair is too damn dark. It is, but did she supposed to, she's supposed to kind of have like a trashy energy about her too. But she doesn't really read as trashy. She just reads like, yeah, It. I don't know that the casting of that character was the best. I didn't mind it. Uh, you know, she's in... Because she's... also her husband's very attractive. And seems like the kind of guy who would want a girl who looks different from her. I did because they try to make her look like what she's supposed to look like with that dark hair, and she has like a belly tattoo, like a thug life tattoo. So it just doesn't. I'm saying that it's not as ridiculous as it sounds, but I just don't think she's like. I, I think she's like seventy percent appropriate for the role. Sure, I, I surprisingly didn't mind her because usually I I don't see the appeal per se. Uh, in a lot of the major filmmakers she's worked with. Uh, but uh, I, she didn't bother me here. Olivia's character at one point, like you mentioned, gets hit in the back. Um, and we assume that it's this family, like, like maybe the shitty husband of Dakota who threw it at her. So she has a big wound on her back. So when Callie sees Olivia's back, she goes, oh my God, like I have a cream for that. And she keeps talking about this cream. And all I kept thinking is like, what is in that ointment? It's crack cream. Like, well, yeah, is this like crack cream? Oh, there's also that scene that's, I think, pretty good where she's watching a movie in a theater. This like little... Yeah. Uh, I think it's, and it's an Elizabeth Taylor film. Like, I don't know if it was Father of the Bride or it was an American 
par- it's something. And these young boys come into the theater and are disruptive. And she loses it. She, yeah. she does have a Karen moment. That was a good moment. There well, was, I mean, I don't think she was out of order for it. She wasn't, but there's some menace there because she she makes such a big deal that that man, like the grandfather or whatever, gets up and says something and finally tells those boys to be quiet. But it's like you were just gonna let them, and all these other people sitting yeah, there. Yeah, all these other adults are letting these like awful kids like be so rude okay there's a scene when um just buckley is like fighting with her daughter and because the daughter ruins her doll and she throws it out the window and then we see the doll like from four stories up hit the street we get a nice shot of it shattering yeah shattering i thought that was a really good scene there's also um this damn doll the family like dakota johnson's family they have they uh, put out a flyer they put out a reward (laughs) for this doll so there are flyers um uh, yeah, my last note about this film was that I think the payoff wasn't worth the discomfort. And I re- meaning like the tension that's created but this plot with this bad family is it, it, like isn't worth it and really really I like I I would have been just fine having it be mainly about Olivia Coleman and Jess Buckley and fl- like those two actors portraying this character and then maybe this connection with Dakota Johnson's character and really having, I don't know, like a character study on these mothers who don't necessarily love being mothers. Well, what is it? Gloria Steinem said women don't automatically make the best mothers. There's, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but she has a very notable quote about that. But I thought of that again watching this. Um, I well, this sh- review is really long. I want to shout out uh, Aline Louvart, who is the cinematographer, who I think is one of the uh, best cinematographers working today. Notably, she lends a couple episodes of uh, a recent Elena Ferrante um, television adaptation of My Brilliant Friend. Um, recently, she's also done All the Dead Ones, uh, directed by Marco Dutra and Caetano Gotardo, and Never Rarely, Sometimes Always for Eliza Hittman, uh, and Beach Rats for Eliza Hittman. Um, what would you give this film? Three and a half. Do you have anything else? No. Listen to our podcast. Bye.